one other thing I want to explain is that Bitcoin is, the client is open source. So just like, um, just like uh, if you speak a language, like English or French or Danish, then you, know, you can read text in those languages. If you're a computer scientist, you can read the protocol of Bitcoin, you can read the code of Bitcoin, and you can know its functions exactly. You can know exactly what it's going to do. And there's no ambiguity in the language, there's no ambiguity in the processes. So you can be guaranteed that assurance. And you can manipulate the program, you can change some of the features, you can change the way it looks, but if you try to change the basic rules of the economy, you'll simply be rejected from the network. And because all of these people, all of the people running the client are propagating the network, it's being upheld decentrally. And unless, unless you can combat all those clients, then, then you cannot manipulate the system. Now, I'm not sure what the statistic right now is, but in order to reach the amount of power necessary to, um, to try to mess around with the Bitcoin system, we're talking about probably taking the you know, top four supercomputers in the world and having them run the Bitcoin you know, code base to, um, and working together maliciously. And if something like that were to happen, it would only temporarily shut down the network and be very costly for the people running it. Actually, one of the amazing things about Bitcoin as well is that when you're processing transactions, and I'll speak more about that later, when you're processing transactions, um, you're in a completely liberal market. So what happened historically was when the client was first released, you could both send and receive payments, but you could also um, be individually upholding the network. And the way you would be doing that is your computer would automatically be solving um, an algorithm and based on the amount of power you're contributing to the network, and everyone at the beginning was contributing essentially the same amount of power, based on the amount of power you're contributing to the network, that means it's a factor of your likelihood to solve the block solve the transactions for those 10 minutes. And inherent in that block is the generated Bitcoins for that block. And those Bitcoins are given to the person who solved the block. If that person solved the block in a malicious manner, then with the next appended block, they would lose those transactions. So unless you have a bunch of malicious, um, what they're called as miners, working together, then if you have, say, for instance, 5% of the network maliciously working together, the chance of solving a block is, of course, 5%. The chance of solving two consecutive blocks is 5% of 5%, which is, what, 0.2%. And that's how very fast you can reach astronomical levels of certainty that the transaction has indeed gone through. Um, does anyone have any questions right now? Yes, I have one. Regarding the fees, uh, isn't there always a fee of zero point zero zero five bitcoins? Um, the current Bitcoin client, uh, I'm not sure what it is right now, but I know a while ago there used to be um, a fee of point one bitcoins, and um, but that fee is completely optional, and they <coughs> took it out, and I don't know if in very recent times they've reamended it, but um, the clients. But I, I've configured my client to not have any fees, and uh, the client that my party is releasing is not going to have any fees. The way Bitcoin works is, right now, people are <coughs> incentivized to, prop, to support the network. And uh, in doing so, they receive, as financial benefit, these generated Bitcoins. Uh, when the amount of Bitcoins in circulation reaches a, the static figure of 21 million, then people will need to incentivize those holding up the economy um, to perform the transactions. And in order to do that, 
they will need to append transaction costs to their transactions. But because any one of us could liberally compete to process those transactions, then what you have is a perfect competition. And we've already seen it, actually. We've already seen people competing perfectly in this market. So I said originally that the main client, when it was first released, we would all download it, and we would all be, you know, our computers would all be running these algorithms, and we'd all be, you know, randomly generating some Bitcoin. And what ended up happening is a lot of people generated Bitcoins, and people started trading them, mostly as a novelty. And after a while, they basically attained some sort of concrete value. And people said, wait a second. Um, I can leave my computer on and just make some money. And then they said, and, but it, really, really fast, so many people started doing that that all of a sudden, the cost of the electricity wasn't worth having your computer run, I mean, having Bitcoin on. So the amount of generated coins that you would receive wasn't worth the cost of running those processes. And people started becoming competitive. And this is one of the beauties of this, actually. This is one of the beauties of Bitcoin. People started becoming really competitive and saying, well, how can I do this better? Uh, I really wish people in the banking world thought like this. How can I do this better? How can I um, do the same amount of work, but by using less energy, by using less electricity? And people switched from using their CPU, their central processing unit, to their GPU and the graphic, graphical processing unit. And by doing so, um, they were able to do the same processes much, much more efficiently with much less power. Then they build separate code base um, specifically for these functions. So then it became even cheaper. And then um, people started putting their systems under dry ice. As of recently, hardware has come out specifically for this task. And uh, there was actually speculation in the field, and it's a really unprofitable, un, you know, it's a really highly competitive and unprofitable field. Something I definitely, and you need to be very technologically savvy to get into it. And I think most people that have actually gotten into that field are now regretting it, which is pretty funny. Um, so, so the idea is, is uh, that people, Anyone is going to be able to liberally compete over the processing of these transactions. And when you have that, when you have that happening, then your system is being upheld in the cheapest way possible. And that's why um, if I send you a Bitcoin, once they're a static figure, you know, it's been estimated that it's only going to be about a tenth of a US penny. And it's probably going to be cheaper if these advances keep happening. So. Uh, let me see. Um, I wanted to talk about the legal status of Bitcoin. So, legally, there's been a lot of questions. People have been afraid, oh, it's going to be criminalized. Um, people can use it for anything. They can use it to buy and sell drugs. It's anonymous. Um, and it's unregulatable. Now, me sending you a Bitcoin is essentially unregulatable. Um, there being some sort of government, t enforceable government tax or enforceable corporate tax, it's pretty impossible to do. Um, like I said, it's just like cash. It's just like me handing you a dollar bill. Um, however, the points of sale are regulatable. So if you're an organized third-party merchant and you're selling fiat currency, for bitcoins or bitcoins for fiat currency, and you're allowing the exchange, then there is a certain amount of regulation that I actually I actually believe that you should be entitled to. And this is one of the problems with Bitcoin. It's very analogous to the early internet. I don't know if um, if you remember, but in the mid '90s, when all of a sudden you could start using credit cards online, people said, "Don't do that. It's risky. Uh, you're going to get scammed." And a lot of the third-party merchants that exist in Bitcoin, well, maybe not a lot of them, but a few notable ones that exist in Bitcoin have been malicious. Um, a lot of them have just been negligent. But all the third-party services 
that you see in the real world. All the banking services, um, all the money sending services, uh, obviously all the merchant services, things like fraud protection, things like trading on margin, things like interest-bearing accounts, you know, which go hand in hand. Uh, those things can all be developed on top of the Bitcoin model. And actually, um, I have a trade page, which uh, this is just a screenshot of a page. And if you go here, you can see a list of the merchants that are dealing in Bitcoins. And in the last five months or six months or so, uh, this site, which doesn't include all the Bitcoin merchants, uh, the merchants accepting Bitcoins, but it's representative probably of, of the percentages. Um, this site has grown by a factor of five or maybe six. And uh, the type of merchants that we see entering now are a lot different than the type of merchants that we saw entering a long time ago. Back before the populariz popularization of Bitcoin in the media, uh, the type of merchants you have were these underground, really techno-savvy idealists who sort of were unhappy with the financial system and they wanted to support the um, just the Bitcoin economy. And so they basically started their own eBay businesses or they already have their eBay businesses, but they started accepting Bitcoins now. And But now what we see is a lot of multi-million dollar businesses who, and real world businesses, restaurants, hotels, hostels, who have been in operation for a long time, who accept many different sorts of payments, and now they also accept Bitcoins. Um, one major organization that accepts Bitcoins is uh, WikiLeaks. WikiLeaks has a banking blockade against them, which you can read at wikileaks.org. And if I wanted to use, they, they used to accept MasterCard. Um, I'm not sure if they used to accept Visa, but um, they used to accept MasterCard. And now MasterCard has decided, you know, and Visa has decided, sorry, uh, we don't politically align with your ideals, and good luck to you. And they suffer the same consequence that I was talking about earlier. The only methods of payments that they accept is bank to bank transfer, and their banks are in Australia. So if we wanted to send, we would have to send a wire transfer, which is going to be about $40. So if you're sending small amounts of money, you simply can't do that. And the other form of payment that they accept is Bitcoins. Now the problem with Bitcoins is, well there are many problems, um, but legally there really aren't that many problems. As I was saying, I think that the third party merchants should be regulated. Obviously, if you trust me with your money and I disappear overnight, there should be some consequences to that. But luckily we're seeing much and much more legitimate businesses come to play. And we're also starting to see, uh, we even had our first court case um, where Bitcoin and it was the um, trading site which I don't advocate for this trading site um, it was a trading site empty docks in uh, in France and I don't I can't go over the specifics of their of their um, case because it's rather complex but uh, but we see governments really looking at it and I also run a trading platform and we've been in direct communication with the FSA and actually, people are being pretty f favorable to it. There is suspicion or rumors that it's going to be considered a currency overlay. Whatever Bitcoin is considered in the future, um, that, that denotes which laws extend to it. So if Bitcoin is called a currency, these <coughs> laws extend to it. If Bitcoin is called a commodity, these laws extend to it. If it's a digital commodity, you know, these laws extend to it. Etc. It's probably going to be considered a currency overlay, which, if that's the case, I, I can't go into the specifics, but it's not that it's not that unfavorable. However, once you have bitcoins, sending bitcoins is completely unre unregulatable. Right? If you send bitcoins, if you want to send bitcoins abroad internationally, if you want to accept bitcoins as donations, you can immediately. Right? Um, 
One thing I wanted to talk about also was the press. And, yeah. Uh, another question before you start with the press. I didn't understand how the uh, amount of bitcoins were created. How do they flow? How, how does that work? There's no central bank, I, I assume. Okay, yeah, yeah. I'll, um, so, as I said, everyone across this network, everyone that's running this program has a file. And that file is the history of all transactions which have ever occurred. Um, and the way it is, is, is it's called a blockchain and has individual blocks. And every 10 minutes, a new block is added. So if I go back to the picture of the client, you'll see that right here, there are the blocks. And it says 132,000 blocks. It's actually an old picture. Um, and that means that basically, it means that the client has been, I mean, the Bitcoin economy has been running for that number times 10 minutes. And on average, every 10 minutes, a new block is added. And that block houses the transactions. And since everyone running this um, client is agreeing to participate in the economy on certain rules, those rules also state that if you process a transaction, you will be rewarded with so many Bitcoins. And that's the case as the number of Bitcoins enters circulation. But that was a very, very small amount processing well, a transaction. You couldn't really speculate it, and you said the, the, the perfect Well, markets. right now, right now, if you, um, well, per transaction, it's different, right? But right now, if you process a block, then you get fi around 50 Bitcoins. It's not always 50, but generally 50 Bitcoins um, <laughs> is rewarded. And if you look, um, 2009, and it's going to change in 2013. And all of a sudden, it's going to half to 25. And then four years later, it's going to half to 12.5 and these the entire you know economy has agreed that these bitcoins will be distributed and that we've distributed to the people who solve these equations and however doing so is a highly competitive field it's not profitable these people aren't really making money anymore um, because they're expending money by holding it up and the chance of you solving one even if you're operating at a professional level even if you have the sophisticated hardware and the mm -hmm. technological expertise. Um, but, but how do I get hold of Bitcoins? So it's just like any other currency. Can I borrow them in a bank? Well, it's just like any other currency. You can um, exchange them for whichever currency you may have, or you can accept them as a form of payment. Or you can do this as well in terms of mining. Mm. Um, but right now you can't borrow against them because the... There is a Bitcoin bank, um, however, it's it's really small time, and it, and they do, I think they do pretty diligent checks, and it would not really be worth the time to, to sort of gain the loan that you'd probably be looking for. But everything we see, all the financial instruments that we see in the real world, can be built off. This is just a payment transfer mechanism, and all those, all the financial um, tools that we see in the real world can be built on top of the backbone of Bitcoin. Think about it like the early web, the internet before the web browser. This is one of the biggest hindrances um, to Bitcoin is that it's you really have to understand the nitty gritty of it and um, and it's pretty hard to use. It's not end user friendly. However, a lot of people in the 80s, actually there's this great video on YouTube with um, Isaac Asimov talking about Wikipedia and all sorts of, you know, um, things that the internet has evolved into, and it's uh, dated, uh, I think, 1988 or 89, and it's it's amazing. And uh, so, if, so if people are looking at the properties, the underlying properties of this system, and saying, "Wow, you can actually send money, not through clearing houses, not through trusted third parties, for a tenth of a penny," but it's really not end user friendly, but those problems are going to be fixed in time. And you had a question, sir? Yeah, I did. Um, you use the expression "we" a lot. Do you mean the general public, or speaking uh, from an institution, or what do you? Oh, mean with um, I guess when I use "we," um, 
And we just, see the first court cases. We see the. Oh yeah, I, I guess what I'm what I'm saying is just the the community. I mean, yes. bit, okay. there's there's a lot of people who. Um, uh, there's a Bitcoin forum. It's called BitcoinTalk.org, and uh, I'm a participant on that forum, and a lot of people are, and um, and I follow it, and and so I'm not a official representative of them. No one is. This this whole thing is yes. pretty decentralized. However, I guess that's 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 the answer to your question. Yeah. What do you mean by solving exactly? Do you use that term? I'm sorry. Solving transactions or. Um. Okay. So. The way it, it retains its decentralization is your computer does algorithms, which are hashing algorithms. And there's no reason to get too technical. But basically, your computer is solving equations, which allow it, which allow the network as a whole to randomize who ends up being rewarded with the ability to process those transactions. Right? So if everyone in this room were processing transactions and we were all solving these mathematical riddles, then imagine they're designed such that we all have an equal opportunity to be the ones to solve them. And that's how it retains its decentralized nature. And actually the history of, um, of this idea it comes from... Uh, the cypherpunks mailing list is, is one of the things. And in the mid 90s or mid to late 90s, people were they were talking about a lot of stuff. The um, a lot of the open source projects, I believe Wikipedia, I know WikiLeaks, I know um, some other ones came out of out of their mailing <coughs> list. And this was a group of people, uh, very well known now, who ended up basically having a lot of discussions. And one of their discussions was how do we make a decentralized currency? And no one, no one knew, uh, no one saw the final piece of the puzzle for a long time. A lot of the puzzle was solved, but the person who finally solved the last piece of the puzzle was this mysterious character, this uh, Satoshi Nakamoto, and he's the one that wrote this client. Um, now, in the year 2000, if you go on Google and you just type um, economist and e-money revisited is what it's called, uh, Ben Friedman, who's the Harvard head of economics, uh, is in this article and he's talking about, this is dated year 2000, he's talking about a new electronic, cur electronic currency coming to light and how governments are going to have to deal with it. And he's pretty much lambasted in this article. It's actually pretty hilarious um, because they pretty much discount him and say, and the other economists that were at this convention or whatever, and the writer pretty much says, yeah, this is never going to happen. What he says is impossible. But it has happened. And um, a lot of his works in the, in the last 10 years have dealt with um, the economics of the introduction of a decentralized currency. Uh, yeah? Well, I have a proposal that we should uh, try to ask all of you how many have downloaded the client already and who owns Bitmoney, Bitcoins. That could be fun. So down the client, how many have downloaded the client already and running that one? Just to see the number. I'm just sure. Okay. And how many then also have Bitcoins? Well, I don't think that's really that representative of the real world. <laughs> no, 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 but that's nice to see. That okay. is nice, though. Yeah. But, um, okay. but right now, I don't, know if, I don't know when you download the client or how often you updo, uh, update your blocks, but it's incredibly tedious. And there's been so many transactions that it's really slow. And, um, and a lot of people think that Bitcoin is not scalable. The truth is, is that the Bitcoin is scalable. However, it isn't with its current client. Um, the way, what happened was, is one person, like I said, solved the final piece of this logic puzzle. And, um, and he must have taken a year or two years, if you look at the code base, because um, he's not a professional programmer. And he must have taken a long time of his life to write this program. And <coughs> it's really, it's perfect, the mathematics are perfect. The security is perfect, 
but it's not modular. The program is not modular. It's not fast. It's clunky. It's hard to manipulate. If you think about um, just a room filled with dominoes, and you're trying to change something, you're trying to make some process faster, and you have to understand the entire layout because everything's self-referential. And our group, um, the Bitcoin Consultancy, for about six months, we've been working on a new client, which is going to engage with the same economy. Obviously, it has to follow the same rules, the same protocol, but it's going to be completely modular. It already um, downloads the blockchain much, much faster than the current client. And when it comes out, when it's um, when it comes out, it's going to be much, much more end user friendly, and it's going to be much more usable. <coughs> People are going to be able to take it and manipulate it, and um, it's open source as well. So. Hopefully, um, a lot of people will be adding code to it as well. Yeah. The name of the client is that Bitcoin J O is the like Lib Bitcoin. Uh, Lib Bitcoin. Yeah. Lib Bitcoin. Oh, sorry, sorry, yeah. <coughs> WikiLeaks is uh, not is going offline uh, for twelve months. Uh, Julian, really? Uh, Julian Assange has just said. <coughs> I did not know. Uh, uh, and. Uh, <coughs> If this is true, then uh, what, what do you think the chances are of uh, Bitcoin playing a, a, a survival uh, role for uh, WikiLeaks in the future? Is it, it sounds pretty cumbersome and, and, and it'll take a long time <coughs> before it will be popular enough for, to, for very well, many people to use it. But what, what are the most optimistic uh, prognoses you can, you can come with uh, to uh, for Bitcoins to play a positive role with the WikiLeaks? Well, I'm a U.S. <coughs> citizen, so I have to be very careful what I say. Um, <laughs> I, I mean, I really have no idea. I really have no idea what the history of WikiLeaks is. I support um, Julian Assange uh, and what he's doing. I think that, um, and I was going to talk about the press, actually. I think that... Uh, his idea of scientific journalism, that journalists should cite all their sources, um, is amazing. I think that um, the disclosure of some things, I think that it's uh, ironic that Hillary Clinton is a Democrat from a generation that ended the Vietnam War, and that the Vietnam War was essentially ended because of leaked documents. Um, so I think that's pretty crazy and that she's really on the offensive um, when it comes to WikiLeaks. But, uh, but no, I have no comment in terms of, I, I think that the way that Bitcoin, I think the potential that Bitcoin has um, isn't because of its, the fact that anyone can accept Bitcoins. I mean, it is that reason, but it isn't because of things like WikiLeaks or, or um, semi-illegal activities. Um, I, I, I really think that it's probably going to play a huge role in places like Africa. I was talking about how sending money is so hard and how it's so expensive. And usually people like us, we can avoid doing it. And if we have to do it, okay, you know, we, we do that. Um, but the people that really get screwed over are the people who don't even have the money to open bank accounts. 